Hey everybody, it's the Jerry Metcalf podcast where top real estate agents tell how they do it. And today we have back on the show, Janie Coffey in Northeast Florida. So Janie was on the show, I think it may have been a year ago now. Um, wow. Yeah. And Isaac, you're going to look up that episode number for us. So we can let everybody know what it was. But at the time she was with Sotheby's International Realty, was a top agent. She had come into the Northeast Florida based in Jacksonville market, but she had come from Miami. She had changed markets, become a top agent in Jacksonville very quickly. Since then you have changed companies and now you're at Compass as yeah. I am. And so I bring all of that up to give a little bit on background, but also to say Janie is an agent who has come into different markets, you know, overcome challenges, come into new markets where she was kind of warned it would be tough to be successful and she blew it out of the park. She came into um, Compass after that. She's blowing out of the park again. But the point of all that is change. And we're going to talk today and get some tips from you, Janie, on, you know, overcoming challenges and change in markets and moving in our business and moving forward and understanding how to deal with that change and just advice on you because cha change, the point of all of that is to rock it and become more passionate about who we are in what we do as we do it. Janie, awesome. welcome <laughs> to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. And this is such a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart because I think the one thing that if you threaded all the different things in my life together, which are vast and varied and all over the place, is change and change is the one thing that basically holds them together and not necessarily being afraid of change but embracing change and taking it head on and um normally that always leads in the beginning with some uncertainty and some things that are very scary but on the other side of that is always something super exciting and always far exceeds what i was hoping to achieve with the change whether that being marrying somebody I knew literally for a month at the time or moving to Germany on a whim or moving to Miami that I was so scared of when I, I did that or moving to Jacksonville when I didn't know a single soul and um, starting over in a brand new city just because I felt like that was the right thing to do or now, like you said, moving to Compass. Um, I've always embraced change. I think it's something that it, it's like a muscle. You need to flex it because if you get too secure in the way you're doing things, it becomes really hard to um, be open to change. But sometimes it's the thing we really need to do. And it's funny, I actually posted on Facebook today about just listening to your gut instinct um, and, and, and listening to that and giving it some credence, whether it trying to, to tamp it down. and. It normally means there's something you need to change in your life, whether yeah. that's your habits, people you spend time with, what you're doing for work, different things like that. I think mm -hmm. that being open to that normally leads to something far better than where you are now if you're feeling uncertain about something. So a question for you. Um, you know, when people are thinking about making change, there are always things that we're excited about, the future, but then there are always things that, people fear. And I think by nature, we naturally listen a lot more to fear than opportunity. And there's even a study about people, well, people will take greater moves to avoid loss, which is kind of a fear mentality, than they right. will to gain. Or they'll, they'll take stronger measures to avoid, they may have a, a strong gain on the other end of what they fear, but because of what they fear losing, they won't make the shift. It's so, the pleasure being principle. What's that? It's the pleasure pain principle. People yeah. will do more to avoid pain than they will for the equal amount or greater pleasure. Exactly. Well, yes, thank you. So <laughs> that kind of goes into listening to your gut. So when you're listening to your gut, we're kind of wired to listen to our gut in a way that we're driven to avoid pain or we're driven yeah. by fear. So how do you get around that? And how do you know when your uh, gut's your gut and when it's right and or when <laughs> well, you're just crazy? I think first of all, yeah. you have to have a trusted person or people in your life that you can bounce things off of. And um, so I have that person that's Shelly Northern. She's my best friend. Um, and we know each other so well. We also know when we might be exaggerating the future pain <laughs> or exaggerating the future win. When you're kidding, and, you know your own, your own like self-deceiving right. nuances. Now, is Shelly also an agent? Sorry? Is she also an agent or is she just a friend? No, she's actually an agent. We owned a brokerage together okay. prior to Sotheby's. 
Um, we started a brokerage together in the height of the recession. Um, we didn't have a sale for the first full year we were in business, and we had an office and everything. Um, and we held wow, it together. Wow, I never knew that. Oh, yeah, wow. we had to shift on a dime because we were doing equestrian real estate. Well, when the market shifted, that business evaporated because people who own that kind of property didn't need to sell. Um, and of course, we, like everybody else, took about six to seven months to figure out, oh, the market has shifted. Wow. Um, and we ended up getting into short sales and did a killing in short sales. And then fast forward five, We have a lot years. in common. Yeah. As <laughs> a, probably a lot of agency, but I actually was in the equestrian field too. About oh, the time. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so into short sales and then... Oh, into short sales. And then Sotheby's in Miami came to town and I absolutely fell in love with that brand. Um, and talking about change, Shelly did not want to change because she's like, we've created this thing. We held it together through the whole recession. I'm not giving up. This is like our baby. Yeah. Um, so I went ahead and made the move without her, which was like having a, it wasn't wow. the emotional breakup of a divorce, but it was still a huge thing. Yeah. Um, four months later, she's like, oh my gosh, I see what big changes are happening for you positively or making this change. So she went over to Sotheby's. Um, we were both with Sotheby's plus or minus, gosh, I want to say seven, eight years. And um, she and I was with Compass. Sotheby's eight years. Yeah. Yeah. She wow. moved to Compass a year ago. And um, then I moved to Compass about four months ago. But she knows me as well, if not better than I know myself and vice versa. So if either one of us think we're getting like, really off track will call and say, Hey, am I really out in left field with this? And we respect each other enough um, that if one of us says, yeah, you are <laughs> like, you're just seeing Listen. this in a weird way. Yeah. Listen. But I think the true magic, and this is kind of going to get woohoo, uh, you know, out there is I do uh, daily visualization every morning ideally uh, before the sun comes up, before there's all the outside noises and the household noises. Mm -hmm. And I visualize my future self. Like I walk myself through the exact same perfect day, um, one or two years out. So I'm almost visiting with my future self wow. every single day. And I'm spending some time with my future self every single day in the environment that I'm crafting for myself. And that becomes- Wow, that's so powerful. It's ridiculously powerful. It's so powerful, Jerry, that when I moved to Jacksonville three years ago and I started to do this, I had made it a goal to reach the top 10 in my MLS within three years. And I reached it within two years, you know that. Mm -hmm. But it started to happen so fast. After about a year of the visualization, the results started to happen so fast that I actually stopped my visualization practice because I was like, I need to put the brakes on this right now because it's coming faster than I'm prepared to handle. I remember um, you said that. Yeah. So it was Isaac, wait, Isaac, what episode was that? 15. Episode 15, everybody. The only 15. Dominating a new market. Dominating a new market. Episode 15. This is like episode 90 something. Yeah. 90, 90. Wow. I'm a founding member wow. of the GRA podcast. Wow. 15. <laughs> it was like, wow. That was wow. over a year ago. Okay. Anyway, so back to, so basically, because we talked about this on that podcast that it was so powerful. You're like, okay, wait a minute. I need I to pause. Stop. And let me tell okay. you what, stopping was the biggest mistake I ever made because then the whole year after that, basically that was almost a year ago now, like you right. said, until now, my life has just been all over the place. Wow. And it was without direction. Finally, I moved to Compass. I'm putting it all back together. I started the visualization again, and I'm back on board because, like I said, I'm really just visiting with my future self, and I'm crafting that out because when you're going through a hard time, and whatever that hard time is, it can be financial, um, health, relationship, job, kids, whatever that hard time is, if you're not taking a moment to kind of step out of that environment, mm -hmm. you're living in that, that bubble of – fear, frustration, um, muck and mire, yeah. and you're not seeing anything outside of it. This is what you're seeing, and this is what you're living, and this is what you're feeling. Yeah. But if you take that little 15, 20 minutes a day to do that visualization with yourself in your perfect day, you know, one or two years from now, you're actually getting out of that and seeing, yes, there is that, like that exists, and that becomes your future pulling you forward. Well, and you end up, 
subconsciously making decisions and doing things throughout your day that will accomplish your future. So well, it becomes that if the future becomes your reality because exactly. you spend so much time in that visualization that everything in this, it sounds stupid and it sounds yeah. silly, I did it, but it starts aligning yourself exactly. with yeah. that, that you. If you don't do that and you stay in the present day reality, then it just, everything just, it, you it, manifest. your reality never changes. Question to this topic. Uh-huh. Have you read the book, The Code of an Extraordinary Mind? No. Make sure you tag that, Isaac. So you're okay. going to love this book because okay. the book is kind of talks about the same thing. Vishen Lakhiani wrote the book. He talks yeah. about the 12 steps and four stages of consciousness. And he uh-huh. has a visualization, visualization practice that you do every day. It's called the six phase meditation. Yeah. And it is so powerful, but it takes you through six stages of meditation where you connect and then you you connect and then your gratitude and then you forgive and then you visualize and then you you see your day and you see everything you're going to do tomorrow if you do it the night before today if you do it the morning of or both that you're going to do today that's going to accomplish your future and then the last stage is realizing kind of like what you're talking about when things are stressful in the moment which they often are in our business yeah. is is seeing them as not being why is this happening to me Ugh. why whatever you know because Everything, what it does is it takes you and it goes, everything that's happening is happening. He doesn't say it this way, but this is what I hear. But it's happening for you, not to you. Yeah, yeah. And then you go through your day and it's also recognizing whether you want that to be God or energy or greater power or or your inner source, whatever you want to call it. Understanding that 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 is looking out for you, not... So then you go out into the world with a whole different mindset. It's like a mind shift like totally new mindset it, anyway and what you focus on is bigger but it's, it's what you're ta- it's the same thing that you're talking so about powerful. so code of an extraordinary mind there's jerry's book of the day <laughs> let's interview janie again but anyway but it's just so resonates because i know exactly there are things that i've visualized and i've done a little bit of the same i've gone like oh my gosh like wow but don't back off of that like that's a message to me don't back different. off to that that's yeah. the one thing if i could go back a year ago when we had our podcast and i said i was backing off that messed me up. I mean, I'll be honest with you. It messed me up because well, you're, all this, you're doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> imagine if, if your body wasn't the way you wanted it to be mm-hmm. either heavier or not muscular, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. If you're only focused on your now environment and your now situation, that becomes the essence of you, the core of you. But if you realize okay, I'm going to visualize myself as a fitter person, a person who exercises, a person who eats right, a person who, you know, doesn't do whatever you have decided is not good for you. And you visualize yourself being that person over and over. You become that person and you realize the state of your body is not a fixed state, meaning yeah. the state of your weight is not a fixed state. The state of uh-huh. anything is not a fixed state. You yeah. have almost complete control of so many things that we all let just happen to us Mm -hmm. rather than whether it's careers, relationships, whatever. Um, But when we meet with our future selves and hang out with our future selves and see the the real us, that is the real us. Mm -hmm. Um, it, It, like I said, it just pulls us forward. So take us through, if you will, or if you can, what is that, like, what is your visualization right what does that look like mm-hmm. <laughs> we should we should I'll, if you ever want i will do this for your group because every time i do this for people it's about a 20 minute thing so we won't do it right now but whenever i do this for people at the end they're like oh my god like you should bottle that and sell it let's bottle it and sell it <laughs> i love it so what it looks like for me okay um and i do something i do something kind of like the six, six levels phase. of meditation yeah um, I get up uh, b- before, um, I have to do it before the sun rises because I'm so easily um, distracted away from a more introspective meditative state that if the sun is up mm-hmm. or there's car noises or pet noises or kid noises, I'll be out of it. So I have to do it before any of that starts. Um, but what I do is I wake up, I just, um, I, I have a little space in, in my house that's the same thing every day, the same little space I deal with, a little meditation cushion. And I start with just kind of a clearing, like visualizing some healing energy. Um, then I send uh, love and gratitude 
in, to the people that are the closest to me in, in my life. And whether that means financial health or physical health or love or career, I just send them a little thing of that. Um, I say the things I'm grateful for. Um, but then I get to the core of it, which is the daily, the, the perfect day visualization. And I, I put that out like one to two years, not 10 years from now, one to two years. And I literally, in my visualization, I start with my eyes closed and I imagine waking up in my bed. I imagine the whole thing, like, what does that feel like? What does my bedroom look like and feel like even in the dark? Um, what do I do next? And I literally spend, it's about a 15 minute thing, but I walk myself through that perfect day of getting up, of doing my visualization, of doing yoga, of taking care of my animals, of preparing my food for the day, of all the things I want to do, then of getting showered and ready for the office, of checking in with my team, driving to the office, all the things I do at a perfect day, um, at the office, then the end of the day, how does that all come together? All the way through, close my eyes, go to sleep. And it's basically the same visualization every day. And I'm seeing, I'm feeling, I'm smelling everything, my home, my office, my pets, myself. Um, and like I said, I, I'm pulling myself into that reality. And it is ridiculously powerful. Wow. It's ridiculously powerful. Um, wow. And how do you close out? So I close out, then I have something, if you follow Napoleon Hill, um, mm -hmm. Think and Grow Rich, he has a thing called the definite main purpose statement. That's a statement that you write for yourself, basically that encapsulates what is your definite main purpose of life. Um, and I say that aloud uh, to myself in my little dark room with my animals. Um, I close that out. <laughs> your animals don't like nudge you. I guess they know. They know like to so, let you do um, No, that's why I had to do it. I, I, I kept having to do it earlier and earlier because I have one cat that if he realizes I'm awake, he's telling me, hey, you need to So I had yeah. to make that earlier and early. And, and I, I did have one dog. I don't have him anymore. That would come lay his head in my lap when I did it because I sit in, on a meditation cushion. Um, awesome. But otherwise, one of them looks at me. The other one looks at me. <laughs> But they're quiet. So um, how did you come up with your statement that encapsulates your purpose in life? And so the definite main purpose statement yeah. by Napoleon Hill is a formulaic thing. So okay. I'm happy to send it to you. That'd be um, great. And you just kind of plug in. It, 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 is a main, it is a formula that you follow from Napoleon Hill that basically steps you through. Um, okay. Exactly what you want. To, and it incorporates everything like your financial uh, your your health and fitness. Your I'm doing your meditation tomorrow. Sorry, Vishen Lakiani, got to try. <laughs> this is awesome. It's very similar to his. The clearing, the connecting, the love. I mean, it's very similar. That's interesting. And you came up with this. I came up with that. I mean, I've taken. I think some of it is I've taken little bits and pieces. Um, I mean, for many years I've studied different ways. I think whatever you want to call it, personal development or growth. Um, yeah. So I found that things resonated the most with me. There's. Um, Two other things I want to add to it. Somebody told me something about uh, a cutting cords meditation. And what that is, is every day um, you have cords that connect you to people. That could be positive, but that could be negative. Maybe you're fighting with somebody or having a tough negotiation. Um, so they have a visualization where they cut that cord so they don't continue that negative energy share um, between you and whomever you're having a thing and just basically pulling themselves back into themselves. I'm going to incorporate that. I haven't done it yet, but I think the energy connection between you and all the people you come across on a daily basis, whether yeah. it's in person or on the phone is very important. It's because huge. There's a lot of people Everything. that drain us of our energy. Um, and if we don't kind of let that go, we'll continue to lose energy and positivity. Oh, yeah. And to what you said, I find like as I get older, even though I'm, a, I'm not getting older, I'm just living longer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be young forever. Anyway. Hey, but, I turn 50 next month. Oh, my gosh. You look amazing. Okay. Awesome. So I'm not there, but I'm not far. <laughs> um, but, cutting, but on the cutting cords, 
on what you were saying, though, is I find like as I do get older, as life goes on and I get wiser and I do my meditation and my yoga and I live life and I just have a different perspective all the time. And I have like what you said, I just kind of am like, kind of like life is just like, even with all the stress and the chaos in general, it's just peaceful. And the more yes. I live, the more positivity, more positive people and positive things just surround me all the time. It's kind of like what you're saying, though. It's amazing how a lot of it, I, I think, is like, is it just, and tell me, do you find is it's like the more you adjust? I remember I'll, 15, 20 years ago, I went through a really rough time. And I had this moment, like everybody was like telling me I was a victim. I was like, no, nope, not a victim. And yeah. I just remember having this epiphany at like 24, however, 25 years old, that like it starts here. Like yeah. everything, like all of the chaos in my world will never change. Right. I can try to adjust and manipulate my outer world all I want, but it just, until I stop and go here, nothing else is ever gonna change. Like I just had this epiphany, but it's back to the meditation. It's back to everything that you're talking about. And it's amazing when you change what's here, there's so much greater things that we can even envision that the world has in store for us if we allow it. And also when we take responsibility um, for our actions. Yes. And by that, I mean, yes. um, there's a lot of things that we could be victim to, whether it's bad relationships, bad jobs, Blame. bad people. Yeah. Um, a market that's changing, yeah. but we ourselves always have the ability to be nimble and shift within that. And as long as we're being nimble and shifting, even when it's shitty, even when I got the cancer diagnosis, like I was like, excuse me for the bad line, but I guess you're going to believe yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, it's a but podcast. Got, we keep all that in. Anyway, unless you want it out. When yeah. I got my cancer diagnosis, I was literally at a Tony, Tony Robbins event. Um, wow. I had zero 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 expectation that that i was like that was not something that i expected so when i got that call i was so blown away and so very clearly i heard a voice that said fuck that shit we're just gonna take care of it so i wow. right then one voice could have said oh my god i'm whatever i was 47 and i have cancer and what does this mean and you know and let myself go that way or i was like okay and I'm not saying that that changed what happened yeah. with my cancer. Um, and there's plenty of people that things don't change, but you can totally control how you deal with something like that or how you deal with a divorce or a business change or anything like that. It comes from us. And when you feel in control, even when things aren't going great, it's a totally different environment. Like you said, I'm not going to be a victim. I'm not going to be a victim yeah. of the market or a bad relationship, or even if somebody took advantage or did something not great. And sometimes that's hard. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's what are we choosing to take action about rather than, you know, wishing things were different and blaming the market, the person. It's not going to change anything. You can't shut up anything. That's a Wayne Dyer quote. You can't shut up anything. Um, yeah, you can't. So, so a few things because there, there are situations where change just happens and we can yeah. deny it or we can embrace it and go with it but there are also times where we make a decision to make a change and how do we know i mean so much of change is really a result of of what's going on in your world and change kind of happens but then there's also the decision to make a change how do you know what changes to make when um especially with all of the changes and a lot of your changes were kind of circumstantial to what was going on but how do you like how do you go because i think a lot of people can very easily just stay put in life and kind of accommodate to what things are and as long as they didn't make a big leap of faith then they don't have to blame themselves for things going wrong right. um and sometimes it is or isn't a good idea to to make changes how do you know what changes to make when what's your thoughts advice around that well i guess change i don't want to say it's like gambling but of course if you play small, you win small. If you play big, you win big, but that also means there's the chance of it not going right. But very few people win big without making changes and taking chances and taking risks. So I think that you have to become comfortable with that. It was certainly a huge risk for me three years ago to move here. And when I say I didn't know a soul, I literally did not know a soul. The only people I knew were the people at the brokerage who hired me. Um, but that was it. I didn't know any friends. I didn't have anybody. Um, 
but something was telling me this is the thing to do. Like this is the now, time. weren't you? And that was bringing you closer to your daughter, wasn't? Or uh, no, she's yeah. two and a half hours away from here okay. still. I mean, I I I did it purely for the the change. Wow. I mean, that was an extra thing that she was closer. Um, but no, I just I did it for the change, and then deciding to make the change to Compass. I've been with Sotheby's for. Um, like eight I said, years. eight years yeah. at that time. And there is not a compass presence here in Northeast Florida. We're it. My team is the only compass people right now. I'm sure it's that will change by yeah. next year. But, you know, those are two fairly big things to change for a real estate person whose business is Here, It's very, like change markets and you didn't have to. I mean, what were right. you thinking? That's not change an easy... Change markets and I didn't have to change brokerages to a brokerage that has no presence so, here. Like... Yeah, why was, and here's a question, and this, I think, when people are thinking about change and what to do with change and why to change, why was, like, you went on, you moved to Jacksonville basically on a gut. Like, this is just yeah. something about the universe, so this is what I need to do. But it sounds like it was the right decision, yes, but why, why, how did you know to do that, and then why was it the right change? You know, it, what made it the right change? I think that it comes down to the core of my being. And the core of my being is I don't want to live an average life. Like, I want to live an extraordinary life. And if I ever get into a point in my life where I feel like it's average, it's okay, it's working, but mm. it's not extraordinary, it's not this person. Like, if I don't feel like I'm living in 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 something that's leading me to be that person, then that's something not right. And I'm not the kind of person who is comfortable settling into what's working and what's the, um, what's that phrase when it's just the same over and over. People are good with that. There's a lot of people who are good with that. Yeah. Uh, my sister, for example, um, does not like anything uncertain. We're the polar opposites. I don't know how we came out of the same parents, so but funny. we did. Yeah. Um, you know, she's the kind of person who has to know what's going on 24 seven. How's it going to turn out and where she could win this. If she goes the riskier route or nothing, if she goes the safe route, she'll almost always go the safe route because that's her comfort. Um, I'm the other way. Like, I always am seeking just to lead a life that's different. It doesn't mean it's better or worse than anybody else's. It's just well, it's better for you. It's yeah, it's better for me um, because to me, living a, a normal life is like death by a thousand paper cuts. It's just like it does not resonate with me. And I guess that that when you're saying, how do you know it's the right decision? I did not know how Jacksonville was going to work out. And yeah. you know, a lot of people that made it the right decision. Yeah. Well, it was a good you know, thing. telling me, yeah, they were like, oh, that's an old boys town. You're not going to get any business. Yeah. You know, we do things that way here and on and on and on and on and on to the point where, you know, this, I basically had to just shut my door and say, I'm not going to listen to these people anymore. Um, but something was telling me this is the right thing to do because I knew I was living my own truth. I know that sounds like such a stupid cliche. Yeah. But living true to myself, true to this person, the future yeah. version. Back to you your, know. back to the visualization and the meditation. Back to the visualization. Right what does that future life look like, and is what I'm doing today in alignment with what it's going to take to get me there? Yes. Okay. Keep it up. No. Then something's not right. And I think that answers the question for anybody that when you're yeah. thinking about change and thinking about you know do I make a change? It's who am I? Who is who am I? What is my purpose? to the Napoleon Hill. Yeah. Who am I living who am I living this life to be? What am I living this life to experience? Yeah. And you know, to who am I who it's all about helping other people. And yeah. let's not kid ourselves. That's what life's about. What are my talents? What are my gifts that I can best live, experience and utilize to the world? And if the question of what you're doing is in line with that, including like, do I like change or not? Can I do that without change? Do I want change? Some of it is a little bit of a I think there's honoring desire because if we're wired with the desire for change it's for a reason to help us fulfill the purpose that we are wired right. and on this planet for yeah like i consider that that future self that vision of my future self i consider that to be the core of who i am maybe i'm not there yet because i still have you honor work. that I honor that. That is the core of who I am. So as long as the things I'm doing are getting me closer to that, um, that's the right thing to do. But if I'm stagnant or stale or moving away from that, 
that's not then you need to change right that's to an that. indicator you need to change that's an indicator of change and i just think that the energy that you're feeling on a day-to-day -day basis and i don't mean body physical energy i mean more energy is this making me positive or is this making me negative is this person adding to a positive feeling or is this person like draining me i have a few people in my life that i love them they're in my life but when i'm on the call it becomes a vent session and I just listen to them, listen to them, listen to them because they need to vent. But yeah. at the same time, that's pulling a little out of me. I made that conscious decision to give them that space. So they have that space to vent, but I can't do it all the time. And for too long, because that's just, you know, and at the end of the day, I'm like this. So I think that if you view everything, is this adding to my energy in a positive way or taking away from it? That's a really good guide to what, should stay the way it is or what needs to maybe be considered about how you could change it. Interesting. I love that. That really gets you to look at things. I think everybody tries to be so practical about things and you miss a you lot. Can't. You miss things that you can't. That's the analysis paralysis. Articulate. Yeah. Yeah. But when yeah. you just break it down to that, that really, cause I even look back at decisions I've made and I'm like, Oh, that's actually why I made that decision. Right. Um, and even if you look at your podcast, yeah. when you started it, because I remember you said, I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know what I'm going right. to get out of it. Right. You know, but at the same time, you felt a positive charge from doing it. Exactly. The logical person would have said, no, Jerry, don't do this. This is taking your time and money away from your sales, which is your hardcore business. But it's multiple fold exactly added to right. you and your being and your person and Everything. And so many other people. Thank you, everybody, yeah. for listening. Absolutely. It really has. That's awesome. I love it. All right. So tell us. So really, I mean, we wanted to have this conversation about change. And as we talk about change, we did talk also, or add any of that you want, but we in change, you know, right now we're at the end of the year. We're at the end of 2018, going into 2019. And we had talked a lot about um things that you can do to jumpstart your business, boost your business into the new year. It adjust, you know, you've done things like you've gone from, you know, kind of a typical sales price to higher sales prices to even higher. I think you've gotten, you've, I think you've sold properties in Jacksonville for around 7 million and Jacksonville is a very modest market. Um, so that's a huge accomplishment, but there are all kinds of things you've done to shift and change. And you had talked about there are things that you can do incrementally or steps you can take when you make change to, to make that shift and make those adjustments and see that new self. Do you have what can yeah, you Yeah, I think that that's a really timely question right now because I think real estate agents are the canary in the coal mine for any big change as far as markets go because we typically start to feel it mm -hmm. before the country. Mm -hmm. and um, nationwide, I can't speak to each individual person's market, of course, um, but nationwide, we've been hearing for a year. Yeah. Is a shift coming? Is something happening? Um, more and more people are starting to say that in their area, the days on market is longer, the inventory is up, the list of sales price ratio is down, mm -hmm. expires are up. Um, and I think any of us like you, like me, who um, were caught in the big recession, not that we're going to have a recession, but in the big recession, we were caught blindsided, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we were figuring it out six months too late. We had a really hard time shifting. I think a lot of us learned through that. Yeah. And we are at the top end of 10 good years of growth in real estate is cyclical. Mm -hmm. So no matter what's going on, no matter what your politics are, what you believe is going on real estate is cyclical. So at some point we're going to have a stabilization period and a little cooling off period. That's just the fact mm -hmm. there's nothing good, bad or wrong about it. Exactly. Um, but I do think, uh, and this is what I've personally done, by the way, I have a, I had a $7.5 million listing. It wasn't sold. And when I changed brokerages, my previous broker, uh, went after that listing. So they wow. have that right. Um, so I don't want, I don't want anybody to think I sold a $7 million, listing, but I'll get it back and I'll sell it. So don't worry. Yes, you will. <laughs> but my point is, yes, when I came here, I made, I really went after the average sales price here in Jacksonville is around 220, 250 maybe. Mm -hmm. I wasn't listing anything under 500,000. So I really went after the, the top, top, my average 
when I was really going home was about my average sale was 1.6, 1.7, which is in the top huge. 81% yeah. of the market. But now that I feel there's some kind of shift or stabilization, or I'm not, I'm not trying to be chicken little, but there's yeah. some kind of something a lot of happen. markets are already like New York City, Chicago. They're in, they're basically in a recession. Yeah, Miami. They, they're feeling it big mm -hmm. time in the agents. Like I said, the agents are the canary in the coal mine. They feel it before anybody else. But what I am doing for me and all my team members, we are specializing in geographical areas that have a variety of price points, meaning we have each one of us is a geographic specialist in areas that have something from the average Jacksonville price to the below average Jacksonville price or Northeast floor price to the luxury. And we've done that with a lot of thought and consideration over the, the past six months so that we have our areas defined and established our presence established mm -hmm. so that as we go forward, um, we can shift either up on the price point if the market stays or gets better, but we can also shift down in the price point if the market slows or stabilizes. Because the one thing that always happens regardless, real estate always gets sold. And <laughs> There's always a seller's market. There's always a seller's market. It's just, where is it? There's it's always just, a where market. is it? Um, and there's always a buyer's market. Yeah. In a downturn because they buy real estate in a downturn. Exactly. Um, and if you're nimble and flexible, you can shift up and down the price point as an agent to where those fish are biting, what's selling. Well, and yeah. I did that very consciously this last six months because I didn't want to get caught with all my inventory, all my expensive inventory uh, too. name recognition only in the high price point yeah. because that's what happened to me 10 years ago. Well, 10 years, well 10 years ago in Atlanta, it was at least it was eighty to ninety percent. It may have even been ninety percent of the sales were under two hundred thousand. Yeah. And in that price range of those homes selling, it was it was for that market. It was actually a seller's market, and those mm -hmm. homes were selling in less than thirty days, and they were selling for ninety eight percent of less price. Absolutely. If you had that market, you had yeah. now that's a different market. But if you and then there was um it, there there was seven hundred fifty thousand dollar price point was the worst not the worst but that was a range that just didn't sell yeah. ever right. maybe because of income and loans i'm sure it was but it's back to your point but i wanted to add on to something you said is people i always talk about like it's important to specialize it's important to be really good and known for something yeah. because if you're not when you say i'm a realtor who do you know that wants to buy or sell a house they think of their grandmother or their best friend who they want to give a referral to but when you have something that you're good at and you have value that you can express and articulate, you win business. Right. Well, then people always say, but that might eliminate opportunity. Number one, you have that's a scarcity mindset, not an abundance mindset, because there's plenty of opportunity. You have right. to position yourself to where you serve people best. But the other thing is in pre preparation for a market shift or for a recession, now you've got to consider, okay, how do I specialize but not specialize myself out of the market for a recession, which is back to your point of, knowing your market, but being able to focus on the price points that are selling that you can serve. Yeah, so, so we picked, um, like I said, we've spent probably, uh, the t our team right now is six people. One of them is a purely administrative, the rest are agents. And we spent about six months analyzing the different markets in all of Northeast Florida that we felt had a breadth of price points, mm -hmm. but were selling well. Um, and each one of us picked one and is becoming the market specialist in that um, because that eliminates a lot of pushback when you go on listing appointments because you know the market better than anybody else. Exactly you, right. is known, um, you know, more than anybody else. The recession or whatever happens, stabilization, I welcome it. A, it clears out all the riffraff of the agents who jumped on board the last few years because they see million dollar agent and they just think it's easy. So I'm happy for that. Um, and so if, if you're positioned now, regardless of what's going to happen, if you position now to be the expert in an area that has a variety of price points, it just gives you a lot more flexibility regardless of the economic up and down because you can shift down, you can shift up, but it's all still within the area. So you're not losing name recognition if you go down because your signs are still out, your properties are still listed in that area or that niche. So 
I'm focusing on historic areas because that's kind of my shrink. Mm-hmm. And of course, I'm always focused on luxury expires um, because that's for for me a, a really special niche and one that I love. I don't like to take a luxury listing when it's first listed. I want to be Why? the second or the third. Third or fourth, or the fourth is always great. Yeah. yeah. What is that like? Second wife, third listing agent. <laughs> Wait, it's, it's it's first love, second wife, third agent. Exactly. I, I love that. So those are my personal two kind of strong suits is historic homes, historic areas, and um, luxury expireds. But my other team members have chosen geographic areas. And we've really done our homework to make sure that those are areas that are going to move regardless of what happens with the economy. Well, while we've still got you on that, tell us a little bit about your team structure. Yeah. How many admin, how many agent, who's, does every, obviously everybody has their market, their niche market. Do you have people in charge of just the listing side and the closing side or that only do administration or? I'll tell you how we are right now and okay. I'll tell you how our future version of ourselves is going to be. Okay. Um, I love it. Yeah. And by the way, are you in the um, team leader compass group on Workplace? Probably. I don't know. I'm on, we, I'm on a I I'm the worst workplace agent ever. Sorry, everybody. And, um, I'm just on there. But no, yeah. no, no. I started it like four months ago, and um, it's all the team leaders get together on a twice a month phone call um, and share a lot of this stuff. Really? And is it your group? It's my group. Right, well, I don't know. Am I on it? Did you I'm add me? Add you. you better <laughs> add me. Yeah. That's Sorry. awesome. No, yeah. No, it's fantastic. And we have some of the best team leaders of the whole country who are contributing. Wow. So anyway, our structure right now is we're six agents um, or six people. Every one of us is licensed. Our, our full-time admin or director of operations is licensed, but for the most part, she's the behind the scenes doing stuff. The other four of us are agents, five of us are agents, four of which have geographic or niche specialties, mm-hmm. like I spoke about. And then one is more of a floater and who likes the lower end. Okay. Um, so who will handle like the lower end buyers or the lower end listings. They just like it. They move faster. Um, they like it. And then the other four of us are specialized in geographic or areas doing right now, both listings and buyers in our own personal sphere. Um, the goal would be by the end of next year to grow probably by four more agents because there's at least four, if not five geographic areas that I want to infill. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have a very systematized approach um, to what that looks like for the agent. And then probably we'll need to grow by two more admin, like a full uh, listing coordinator and a full uh, transaction coordinator. Mm-hmm. Us up to three full-time people and probably a few freelance people helping with um, kind of taking the marketing and running with it because our one person can't. And we've, That's we've awesome. gone back and forth with having freelancers the whole time anyway. And I just find them um, really helpful. Yeah. Um, we have, we have, we have marketing at compass, but I also use a freelance marketing comp person right. to do marketing. She's really good. I almost think I should just hire her full time. She's great. Right. I mean, and marketing yeah. is huge. So we only have two agents, but we already have the listing manager and the closing manager because Jerry Metcalf does not like paperwork. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> and we have like a we have a director of operations that's also kind of like I told her she's my mom. She's like the team yeah. mom. No, I said I need a handler. Like okay. that's the one thing I need. I need a handler. When I when she I was like your job is to be our mom, especially mine. I need a mom. Just be my work mom. So and she's got that Hold me sweet together, little. Figure my crap out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because my my personal highest and best skill set is either working with the team members, solidifying our systems or out there, and, and my goal is to get more and more out of necessarily having to be the person yeah. there, because I can't be at every listing appointment, not that I am, but I can't be at every listing appointment handling every negotiation, because that's what the clients feel the most comfortable about. Right. I'm trying to pull myself more and more out of that um, and, and strengthen the team members we have to be able to fill in as needed. And there's one or two who are definitely strong in that. So how do you handle when you've got four agents or five agents, including you, that are specializing in markets? What if you've got, like, let's say one agent has one agent's in St. Augustine and the other agent's in Jacksonville, but the Jacksonville agent has a St. Augustine seller. Um, 
They're not. So if, if somebody has a seller because that's okay. their sphere or they came across it, okay. it's not that the other people can't list there. But I created basically a farming protocol that's a combination of direct mail, cold calling, expired, open houses, social media, market reports, that if they're geographically specializing in, they have to do all those things. So basically, I call it swarming an area where okay. they become omnipresent everywhere in all the different ways so their job their role as a team member is to be the present agent in that market yes and to create a presence now how do you let's say that agent's in that market and that agent's like Janie what do I need you for I'm out of here I'm going to dominate this market and start my own little team what do you do about that or how do you so prevent I, that I or how do you two, that's a great question and that's one question that's something you know in my, my previous self when I was the executive vice president of Sotheby's, I ran into that situation all the time mm -hmm. because team leaders, what, what we do, as you know, we get really excited. We're out there, we're hustling, we're hustling, we're hustling. And then we have a need and we meet some awesome person. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh my gosh, I have to have this person on my team. Yeah. You know, come, 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 come. Not realizing that they're bringing on a mini version of themselves. Right. And if you bring on a mini version of yourself, there is a very good chance that in a year or two, when they've learned everything you have to teach them, they're going to want to go off and be the Amy Smith team over here. At the same time, there's a lot of agents, and I would say a much, much higher percentage of agents that do not want to be that Amy Smith team leader. They want to have structure. They want to have systems. They want to have the camaraderie of a team, and they will always want to be on a team because that's where they feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So hiring them and understanding that from the hiring time is way more important now, how do you so how do you know how do you how do you I think know you have a gut again back to your yeah. gut when, when all the time when i was at sotheby's agents team leaders would come to me and say i've met this person i'm so excited i want you to meet them we'd have the meeting they'd walk away and i was like do not hire that person that person is the kind of person that's not that they're bad but they have that kind of huge level drive that for sure in two years they're not going to be satisfied with being a team member but at the same time there's it, it comes down to like the disc personality there's a mm -hmm. lot of people that are really happy and want to be on a team so you've got to figure that out in the front end you have to have your hiring kind of protocol worked out you know i know some team leaders have a seven step hiring process mm -hmm. because there's nothing more costly than the wrong hire especially as an agent, because you spend so much time training them, so much time invested in them, so much time getting them on board. You're front end loading that asset, that mm -hmm. team member. And if you do all of that because you didn't identify them as a their own team leader in the future, and then they cut bait in two years, you've put all your assets, all your energy, all your everything into that person. You've given them that gift that you you yourself spent 10, like me and you, right. 10, 15 years learning, growing, perfecting. Um, so you've got to be slow to hire and fast to let go if it's not a fit. And you don't let them go. Nobody's a bad person. It's just right. might, might not be the right fit. Might not exactly. be the right fit for what you see that they want or the right fit for what you need in your organization or team. Um, so you can have a disc profile. You can have them meet the other team members so that you're not blinded. Like I said, I go back to my friend Shelly all the time and say, hey, you know, maybe I'm not seeing this really clearly because I want it so much to work out or not to work out. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have, you, you, if you want to grow a team, you have long-standing team members. Very often, it's not about the split. And this is not just team members. This is agents with brokerages. Very little is it ever really about the split that person is getting mm -hmm. it's about what is the whole thing that they're getting and how is that helping them to achieve their own personal goals so if somebody's own personal goal is to be a rock star agent this probably not a good fit for your team mm -hmm. uh, but if somebody wants to make a good living for their family and they like the structure and they want some direction um and they like the way your team works they might be a good fit exactly I truly think only 10 or 20% of all Asians nationwide, probably not even that high, really want to be that big team leader type person. I think the rest, they really just like to work with buyers and sellers and they like to make a nice income and they like the, the fact of being independent from a traditional salary job, but they're happy yeah. to do that within structure. 
exactly. The culture, of course, is part of part of that. Awesome. How long do you interview somebody before you bring them on the team? And then we're going to start closing out in a minute. But this is good stuff. No, no, that's okay. Yeah. Um, so all of my current team members, I knew for a long time. Um, one of them was an agent with Sotheby's down in Miami who made the decision to move to Northeast Florida. So I had known him even before both of us were with Sotheby's. Yeah. Two of them had been with the Sotheby's here. So I knew them for at least a year before they came on board. And then two of them, one was, it's a mother and son. One was actually my um, listing. And we got to know each other really, really oh, well. The best. With that yeah. listing. And um, she and her son ended up coming. And neither one had been in real estate prior, but they just really wanted to be. And they had a great, both of them had individually great backgrounds. Um, for that. So I knew all of them. It makes me very nervous for new hires, but I'm having to, like I said, by next year, I'd like to add four or five more agents. Um, and I have the process already mapped out. Um, and a lot of it is just getting down to the core of what do they really want in life Yeah. to make sure that what I'm offering them will help them get to what they want in life. Um, otherwise exactly. it's not going to be a good fit. Exactly. So, and, when so the agents on the team you talk about giving them structure and giving them marketing and you talk about swarming a market do you mm -hmm. kind of have a template in place of social media marketing all of that everything. and then they kind everything. of just oh that's incredible i love Every, that. everything is everything is and did you create all of that yeah for them? okay yeah no it's been it's been 10 years of creation and it's almost like plug and play like it's a it's it's a big learning curve to, to get them on board, but between the expired, uh, going after, between picking the farm, between the social media, how to hold an open house, um, all of those things, it's already explained what to do, how to do it. Wow. Uh, and do you pay for the marketing that they're doing? So right now, um, I pay for the marketing for the team. Mm -hmm. And for my own, three of them are also doing their own farming. And by farming, I mean direct mail as well. Mm -hmm. They pay for that direct mail for, for the area that they chose to farm. Mm -hmm. in, in return, they have a higher uh, split because oh, cool. I'm, I'm encouraging them to invest in themselves. I love it. And then everything's branded for the team. Everything's branded for the team. And then they, of course, are, you know, Janie Coffee at the coffee team or Mary Smith at the coffee team. Yeah. Um, everything's brand for the team. We have, I can't really spin my camera around, but we have a ton of stuff. Like we have the nice open house, um, you know, canvas flags. We have a cornhole game. Um, we have. Oh, you have the flags. Did Compass give you those or did you? I bought them. Compass helped me um, have them designed. Um, they're awesome looking. Because we, we need to get some of the flags because these the yes, we got, are just, um, yeah, a cooler, love it. We got a cooler for open houses. We have a cornhole game. Here, I'll show you the cornhole game. Awesome. <laughs> this is such a big hit. You're going to love this. I'm loving the background noise. Uh, so it's, it's the eight principles. Oh, uh, we're getting one of those made. Yeah, so we got that. We have the. Um, well, I'm getting one of those made for my office, but what is that? So, what is that for? Huh? So, what's to, the, to open houses and events and things like that? Yeah, but what's the, um, like. Oh, it's cornhole, that game, you know, where you oh, play. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Awesome. Like, there's two pieces. Um, so, we have that. We have the big flags. We have a nice cooler for open houses. Um, I'm gonna be a t I'm gonna be an agent on your team for a year. And <laughs> so that's, that's my awesome. point. Yeah. And when you said why why would they want to stay with you? My goal is to provide them so much structure and things already created for them that it's plug and play. Yeah. They don't have to figure out what's the most effective frequency to contact expires. Right. What's the best way to follow up with my sphere of influence? What's the we we help them with all of that they just have to do it so do you schedule it all for them and then they just get on their crm and like do what it says yeah, everything's or? the action plans are already in the crm that's awesome which crm do you use top producer 
Oh, no, I shouldn't say that. Edit that out, Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's the only one I have. actually is the one I love. Um, they got a because, great workflow. Yeah. Well, maybe I might look at it. I mean, because of the way we do our expired plan, which is yeah. a combination of postcards, um, letters, packages, and And email. I think Top Producer builds some of that in for you, whereas I think it's I the only one that I found and I looked and I looked and I looked. It's think, the only one that can handle it. I think Realvolve may have something pre-scripted. Okay. And I just if, got all If Top Producer's and, working um, for you, you know. No, no it's I'm working. Gonna, I'm going to yeah. teach you. Uh -uh. We just got, I had, I'll show it to you right now. Um, because I go so heavily after expires, I had 13 case studies made of previously oh, expired lessons. 13 case goals. studies. Wow. Yeah, and so look, I have this whole series, says was, and there's 13 of them, says was your home marketed like this with the picture. And then it says history, meaning we're the second, third, fourth agents on the scene. What did we think when we an analyzed why it didn't sell? What were our solutions? What we, did we do? And what was the result? Um, and then a link to the listing themselves. And so we're just starting this expired campaign. Um, did you, like you said, came up with that. That's brilliant. Yeah, 13 sets. <laughs> yeah. You are a force to be reckoned with, Janie. That's when it comes awesome. to expires, I knock somebody's socks off. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. So wow. yeah, those are all case studies of successful expired sales. Um, oh, awesome! And you are often the third listing agents. Often. God, that's the that's the way to do it. That's incredible. So that's going back to how do you make sure somebody wants to stay with your team? A, you've got to hire right. You've got to hire the person who sees value in what you offer, mm -hmm. um, and continually provide and give them things that they wouldn't be able to provide themselves otherwise and they shouldn't be spending the time doing all this mm -hmm. they should be out there selling exactly you know exactly and that's the trade-off exactly awesome i love that's it that's what i think and my team members think so yeah all right so now final three okay. i always finish with my final three questions number one wow. um what tool do you find is the most powerful other than your cell phone for your team or your business? I would say equally top producer or a CRM, especially if you have sequences, action plans, workflows, and we could not survive as a team without Slack. So basically a CRM with action plans and workflows. A CRM with action plans and workflows, and we use Slack for everything as far as communications between the team. Okay. That way you don't have to search emails. And then uh, oh, awesome. Slack's awesome. And then, so CRM, top producer, has great work plans and workflows, or plans and workflows, action plans and workflows, or Slack. Um, and the next one is, if there's one book you would tell us to read, what would that be? This is all for real estate agents. Which one? This is all for real estate agents. Yeah. Or business um, people. But for yeah. sure, if you haven't read um, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent by Gary Keller, um, that everybody should read every single year over and over. I consider that like the Bible of real estate. And I would highly suggest Shift by Gary Keller, too, which is how to prepare for any shift in the market. Um, and if you're just a regular person? If you're just a regular person? <laughs> I don't know any regular people. <laughs> There are no regular people. Um, a book I love, it's, it's an older book, but I think it's a beautiful book. It's called Lip From Within. Um, oh, I like it. I like the name. Very easy, short read. Um, and it's just about how to, you know, lip from within. Is like what are the things inside of us that resonate, that glow, that touch people? Yeah. Like I'm going to go backwards for a minute. I wanted to ask you one other thing about your other two books. What was your biggest takeaway from each of um, Millionaire Real Estate Agent? What was your biggest takeaway from Shift? Um, so Millionaire Real Estate Agent, if, if you haven't read it, first of all, I think, I think it's revolutionary. Um, the thought that, and as team leaders, you'll resonate with this, but the thought that 
A, you don't have to be, or you shouldn't try to fit yourself, as a single agent, trying to fit yourself in the hole of the person who knows how to list properties, who knows how to market them, who knows how to remember the kids' names, who knows, right. you know, yeah. does all of that. Like, you cap yourself at what you're capable of when you try to do it by yourself. But more than that, to realize if you go through the stages of, um, you know, working in the business and working on the business, you can get to a point where you have a functioning team um, where you're, you're out of it to some degree. Mm-hmm. At, you know, most old school agents just thought I'm going to bust my butt for however long and then I'm going to retire and that's the end of it. If you follow the, the Gary Keller kind of model, the team leader, you can work your way up and then you basically create a little mini corporation that you can step out of, yeah. but that mini corporation is still functioning, is still earning money and you're still earning money. Yeah. So that's huge from that. In shift, I think just to be nimble, you know, they talk about going back to the basics. Um, I, I think that anybody should just uh, embrace whatever shift might be coming um, because it, it always leads to a lot of opportunities. You just have to figure out, like you said, there's always buyers and there's always sellers. You just can't get stuck <laughs> where those two people aren't actually transacting. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And lit from within, what's your biggest takeaway from that one? Oh God, I haven't read that in so long, um, but it, it really impacted me greatly just about being kind of that light in most of the things that back to our conversation at the beginning of the um, podcast was almost everything is internal, whether it's how we take adversity, how, what action we take, um, our level of success or feeling like we've arrived or whatever it's internal it's not these these outside things or wins or bragging rights or shiny objects it's all here um and that's one thing i'll tell you what during the recession i don't know how bad it was for you financially yeah devastating like when people talk about eating ramen that's no joke like You know, I was eating ramen. I knew how to, you know, extend the power bill. I knew how to do all the things that I never in my life thought. But once you go through that, um, you realize, again, you're just like I was talking about your weight or your physical being, your financial success or not success is not your core, meaning that can change. That can change tomorrow. That Mm -hmm. can change for the good. That's a situation you find yourself in currently, but it's just a situation. It's not you. And I really am thankful that I went through that super tough time during the recession because I realized I can go through anything. Like I can overcome anything. I'm okay. Like I will be okay. And that's That's just, that's powerful to have that. You know, yeah, that's a gift to have that. I think a lot of people don't have that. It's kind of like, Wayne Dyer, I've quoted Wayne Dyer several times today. Make sure we tag him Isaac, because I love Wayne Dyer, mm-hmm. even though he passed away, I think, two or three years ago. But he said, never take away from your children the privilege to struggle. Yes. Like, there's something in that that we all learn about ourselves and self-actualize, and that we have find our little light within um, when we have that opportunity to do that and take care of ourselves. I think um, it's a definite gift. Yeah, exactly. And I love the way, you, like, I can, like, when you say it, it's like, yes. Okay, mm-hmm. last question. Uh-huh. What is the one thing that you hope? And we have gone, a lot of this has been about change, but we've kind of gone into other things about team and business. So it's been an awesome, broad interview. But what is the one thing that you would want all of us listening to you today um, to take away from this? Just be open to and embrace change. Don't be scared of it. Follow your gut. Follow your instinct. If the one thing I see agents in over and over and over is in brokerage or whatever setup it is, whether it, you're in a team or a part, real estate related, mm-hmm. a team or a partnership or a geographic area or a brokerage that's not working for you, that's not feeding your future highest self, change it. Like, change it. I see so many people scared to change. They hate the city they're in. They've outgrown it. They want to go to Colorado or they want to go to Barbados or whatever that is. But they're like, how can I ever start over? You can totally start over. Same thing. If you've been in a brokerage for 30 years, but it's not working for you anymore or in a partnership or whatever, change it. Like that's the one thing I was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Just work. Seek the thing that lights you up 
and get away from the things that are not lighting you up. Like that's the one thing in life and everything else, but in business for sure. Um, don't keep putting up with anything. You, you have one life. Again, like don't, I said, keep, don't keep putting up with anything. Is that what you said? Don't keep just putting yeah. up. That's what most of us yeah. do. We put up. Or ta- everybody. We put up with an unhappy relationship. We Wayne put up Di- with an unhappy work relationship. Wayne Dyer again. Wayne Dyer says, this is all maybe, coming. Maybe this is know. like, you got to listen. I'm going to get you. It's an audio. It's a speech he did. Like, 25 or 30, he was like young Wayne Dyer. But obviously this is bringing so much of it back. But he says, there are people in life and it's almost a paradigm that I think a lot of people live in that they don't even recognize of coping. Like the goal is to cope. Like how do I, like people go to a therapist to cope. People go to the doctor so they can cope. And then there are those people in the world that are like, like, like cope, forget cope, like thrive. Like you can cope or you can thrive. Like, are you coping? Are you just coping with life? Are you being your best? Are you thriving and being who you really are? Because that's going to be your best, the best way you can ever serve the world is to do that. Because the things don't change. The things that are coming at you don't change. The only thing that changes, like this is when I had, when I had my first surgery from the cancer, I was literally out of it wearing a mermaid princess crown, like the little mermaid. Because I was like, you know what? If I'm going to go through this, so they had me like completely out of it yeah. with this little mermaid of Princess Crown. Um, that made me feel better. And it made everybody in the stupid cancer section wow. or it was a hospital yeah. driving by seeing me or going down in the wheelchair, seeing me like that. It made them smile. It made them laugh. Yeah. Like we can't change a there lot. There's a of lot people. of power in laughter. Yeah. There's a lot of power in laughter. And there's a lot of power in taking control of our own state rather than feeling upset that this thing happened to us you know yep so i i think that's what i i would tell everybody just don't put up with stuff that's not if, if you feel it's not true to your essence or getting you on that path don't put up with it make a change like Love think it. about the worst thing that could happen and probably it's not that it's bad never as bad as you think it is it's never never, never as bad as you think it is awesome. so make that change Awesome. I love it. Thank you so much, Janie.